like an onion. We're peeling back the layers and we're like, oh my goodness. Oh, I was never allowed to explore this before. I'm curious about this. And so checking in, because to assume that sex is to stay the same is a, is a, a recipe for failure. You're listening to Get Your Marriage On, the fun and spicy podcast, bringing you new tools and fresh ideas so that you can be the sexiest couple you know. Everyone, welcome back to this episode of Get Your Marriage On. Today, my guest is Daniel Burgess. He's a licensed marriage family therapist, licensed in multiple states. He's been doing this for years, and he's an expert at helping people integrate their faith and their intimacy in their own lives. I think you'll love to hear him. He's the founder of the Improving Intimacy Group and has Facebook groups about that and his own private practice. Welcome to his show today, Daniel. Thank you, Dan, for having me. How long have you been doing this uh, therapy for couples? Oh, geez, for just about over a decade now. That's awesome. Yes. That's awesome. Uh, as you work with couples all over, what would you say, or individuals too, couples and individuals you see, what's the number one issue you see propping up all the time that has to do with their faith yeah. and integrating it to their sexuality? Yes. Uh, you know, I'm going to answer this in kind of a concept at first, and then, and then I'll break it down. Uh, we often talk about there's these popular ideas that, you know, money, sex, and what is it, kids are the biggest leading factors to divorce. Well, that's true. I think there's an overarching theme that I think couples come in that are the biggest issue. And the concept that uh, I'm actually writing a book around is called, I didn't marry a therapist. And let me explain that. All right. When I've worked with couples, it's always fascinating because when these two individuals marry who are in love and then they engage in matrimony and life and children, there is a certain expectation. So that's one idea. These, these expectations that are, that are implied or, or assumed by each other. But there's this expectation that the other should know how to empathize with us perfectly or communicate with us perfectly. And here I am, a relationship expert, and me and my wife are constantly refining it. And there's this idea that if you're in love, then you will have this natural ability to communicate, connect, and empathize. And that's probably one of the biggest and harmful myths out there. And I think it's big. It really encompasses just about everything, whether it's sex, child raising, uh, how to get your partner to clean up after them, everything. It seems like they, they believe we should have this natural ability to connect and communicate uh, and there isn't really a specific thing there. And that's why I tend to pull away from this idea of sex, children, money, because it, that's kind of the symptom in my, my perspective, my experience. And it's this idea that our partners should have these skills that even trained therapists are working to improve and to build in their relationship. And that expectation really sets, us, sets both in the relationship for failure. Oh, gotcha. But that's probably a lifelong pursuit, right? It's not something Absolutely. you master in your first year of marriage and then you're okay. <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's compounded by the idea, especially for a, a faithful a Christian population who uh, have a belief that we are led to our partners, you know, by God, by inspiration, by important factors in our life. Be, yeah. And therefore, as a result, we should have this natural ability to communicate. And so I think that type of thinking really sets us up for failure in how that friendship should develop over time. So yeah, I, it, it, we each should all, I, this is one of the professions that we all should strive to do well in, whether or not we're a therapist, we should learn how to have therapeutic skills in conversating and, and sex and in parenting and all aspects of, of relationships. And that takes time. Yeah, they don't teach that in public school, do they? Nah. <laughs> and we don't, I, I'm on those classes. <laughs> and and the, the most difficult thing about this is, is, yes, we're not taught it in school. And I hate to say this, for the most part, uh, and this isn't an absolute, of course, but we aren't taught this by our own family. No, and that's, that's we the thing. Inherit, we inherit those ideas going into mm -hmm. our marriage from, that's all we knew. 
Mm -hmm. When you have conflict, we deal with conflict the way it was in our home growing up. And that's, we think that's it. It's, it's interesting because as I hear partners often say, it's strange. Why, why would he or she ever do this? And then I, I point out, you're coming from the framework of your own family culture. That's why it's strange to you. It's not necessarily wrong. It's just different. And so it's, it's a constant reminder. That's, we are raised with our family culture. And I hate, again, I hate to say it, but we aren't taught well what healthy behavior looks like. I like that, especially what you said about um, it's not necessarily wrong, it's just different. I'm thinking back to my own conflicts, my own marriage, like what I hold in my mind, what I believe to be true is sometimes very opposite of what my wife in her high mind holds to be true. Mm -hmm. Yet in her mind, it's true. And in my mind, it's true. And they're both true and they're both wrong <laughs> at the same time. And that's not the point. The yes. point is being able to work through that. So how do you take something like that and learn how to communicate that and work through that? I change language. I, I really encourage uh, different uses of, of vocabulary in a marriage to help us remember how to engage in our spouse. For example, um, you know, instead of saying I love my spouse or, or I accept my spouse, I actually really hate that language. I realize that's more of a pet peeve. You don't accept your spouse you should adore your spouse. And that adoring language creates a curiosity, creates an openness. It doesn't place conditions on it. Now, that's not a perfect way uh, to do it, but it's definitely a better starting point to say or learn how to adore my partner in their differences, as opposed to their wrongs or their rights, in their differences, than to say, I love my partner and I accept that they're this way. That's a very, that's a non sequitur. It's, it's very, where sounds do you like go from up. there? Uh -huh. It sounds like you've given up and it's like you're tolerating your partner. That type of language, I realize in it, there is some, some semantics there. So it's not like I'm being overly nuanced and saying, don't say you accept your partner, but that really does come from a place of judgment. It's like, they're different. I accept the fact that he doesn't pick up the towel after his shower. Well, where do you go from that? <laughs> it's either abandon yourself to misery or or just get over it yourself. But there isn't any connection. There isn't any emotional development in that with your partner. And there creates this uneven playing field. You're, you're no longer equal when you phrase things that way. And so that's the first place I usually start. Every situation's a, a little bit different but changing the vocabulary around how we say we love. And when we say we do love, provide some specifics instead of just blanketly saying, I love you, or say, this is why, my goodness, the way that you love me, the way I saw you, you know, playing with the kids, that just brought so much joy to me. That adds depth. And usually the couples that are struggling are nearly void of that type of communication. That's a general pattern. Another word I like is cherishing. Oh, cherishing is a great one. Great word. Yeah. But how do I cherish them if they're so different? Ah, therein lies the secret to success. <laughs> and giving up your sense of feeling like you have to control or change another human being so that you can love them. Do you hear kind of the pattern yeah. there? It's like, uh -huh. <laughs> for me to love you, you have to be what I think is right. And that's a very manipulative I don't want to take that to an extreme. I think there's some elements of, okay, we need to learn how to live with each other. Uh, and we're two very different people. But that approach is really what I see a lot of is this controlling through love type of approach. Uh -huh. Can I put it that way? Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay. But herein also lies the opportunity and the challenge. Absolutely. Right. It's that forcing you to grow. And that's where the growth in the relationship really comes from. That's exactly right. Does that also apply to like developing one's sexual capacity too? Absolutely. In fact, I, I often phrase in, in no analogy is perfect, so I don't want to overemphasize this, but sex and, and communication are essentially the same thing. We may have different ways of verbally communicating with each other, but it would be wrong for me to, for example, say, your way of communicating is wrong and it's, and it's, it's bad. Clearly, if there's 
abusive language in there. We don't want that. But everybody has a different way of interpreting words and experiences. So sex is very much the same way. It's a form of communication. It's a form of sacrament. It's a form of, of vulnerability. And therefore, instead of seeing things as weird, different, or unacceptable, uh, approaching it from a framework of adoring and curiosity and being able to see it, the person is a unique individual and we can love them. And even though the behavior is different, we can learn to value them through learning what that is. So Daniel, I get emails once in a while from people that have downloaded my apps and they'll, mm -hmm. they'll write in certain questions, or I see this in Facebook groups often or, or wherever they message and say, is blank blank okay for Christians to do? Or is it okay that is such and such sexual activity okay? And, and mm -hmm. I, I want to address that. Like, yeah. I want to know your thoughts on that, that question. Like, I think people yeah. want some sort of a list given to them like a checklist, like this is okay to do, and this is not okay to do. But I, something in me says that's not right, not helpful. No. Elaborate on that. Yeah, I think it's a, a valuable question and an important one to ask at some point in the relationship. Um, what it does, however, is it places an, an idea or a rule or a parameter above our partner, and dare I even say our God, because when we're looking at some specifics and trying to create a list of what is, a, is right or wrong, we're actually ignoring our partner in that experience. While some may view this as trying to do right and you know, making sure they're right before God, they're missing a key component here, and that is communicating with God and your partner, uh, as opposed to seeking for a list from somebody else. Again, I, I want to be very clear. I'm not shaming or criticizing. I do think it's, it's, it's a question that we all should ask at some point and explore and reconcile with maybe our, our core values. And I think that's usually why we're asking these questions is because it, it feels like it conflicts with our core values. And that's what sparks these questions. And so um, while I think these are good questions, I think they're also powerful opportunities for us to, to then turn to our partner and build that relationship through exploring with them and your God, uh, whether it's through prayer or meditation or however you may go about doing that, journaling uh, and taking those questions to your relationship as opposed to outside of your relationship. And you'll be impressed to find that you'll discover um, maybe solutions or ideas that weren't present before, and you're building a connection with your partner. I think this is absolutely critical. Uh, let me give you an example, because I'm sure people are out there thinking, well, my partner does this and that. And again, I want to be very- to try this. Or wants, or wants to, to try it. And or I they think keep... that's disgusting, right? Uh -huh. Yes, I think, oh, that's a great example. And before I jump into this, because I know doing a podcast myself, there's a broad spectrum of people out there and their experiences. And I want to make it clear right up front. There is a very big difference between abusive behavior and behavior that's uncomfortable or unfamiliar. And part of this experience is, is understanding uh, the differences. If you are not wanting to engage in a, in a behavior because it feels abusive or your partner is being abusive, I think that distinction has to be made. And that's a very different topic, right? Definitely. How do we handle abuse? And so that's important. I, I want to I wanna make that clear as we're discussing this and so that we're not confusing terms or anything like that. But yes, when, when we say things, uh, so I'm, I'm speaking from the context that there is no abuse, uh, but that behavior is, is just unfamiliar and awkward or uncomfortable. And when we frame things like I was talking about in communication, like the way you're talking is just dumb or uncomfortable. The way you want to have sex is gross or whatever. We're immediately creating an unequal playing field in the relationship. We are shaming and we are, we are essentially saying, we don't love you in a way that we want to explore you. 
that part of you is something I don't want anything to do. Now, if you were to do that with any other behavior, for example, if my wife comes in and she loves talking to me and I, and I say, gosh, this is just overwhelming. I can't believe you're, don't talk to me right now. That would, we would all see that as very, gosh, even maybe a, a little abusive. We should approach these conversations in a much more adoring and cherishable way that's inviting and curious. Now, curiosity doesn't mean you're immediately going to do something, but what you're doing is you're opening up the door for connection, emotional connection. Instead of saying things, for example, why do you want to do that? Or that's gross. You say, that's interesting. So you start to start focusing on curiosity language. That's interesting. I wasn't aware that you're in this excites you. Tell me more about this. What about it is arousing to you? So what you're doing there is you're, you're doing at least two things. You're creating uh, an open door. You're, you're being inviting. You're, you're, you're creating this equal playing field in the relationship. And you're using this experience to create an emotional and sexual connection with your partner. You don't have to necessarily agree for it to be a beneficial experience. And so as you open that emotional door, you're inviting the other person to say, thank you. I would love to share with you. In fact, I don't even know how to share with you because it's uncomfortable or it's vulnerable, but gosh, if you're willing, I'd love to explore this with you. And then you start to see the person in the experience as opposed to the act that is annoying in the person you love. Gotcha. And isn't that extremely, I'm going to use the word loving act. I know that, yes. But it's like, it's very loving to let the other person, like just give them space to mm -hmm. kind of uh, hear them out. He or she express what it is she or she wants to try or do. That's that giving that space without judgment, that in and of itself is beautiful. Even, even our looks, we got to be very cognizant of what we're expressing through our face, facial features too. Like if your partner says, I would love to try anal or oral or some other type of sexual experience. And, and you have that reaction like, okay, that communicates a lot. And I think that, uh, I, I don't want to stereotype, but I, I, I do find a very common theme with men, uh, especially men in the faith who are very, they take, they take it to heart. They're like, oh my goodness, that I just weirded my wife out. I don't want to do that. So they won't bring it up. They won't talk about it. And then uh, they hide it and they bury it and it goes they, into secret and that mm -hmm. into the darkness and that festers and grows and that's not helpful either. Absolutely. And at some point it will come out, whether it's resentment, frustration, or years down the road, it will feel like a surprise to the other person because like, why didn't you ever tell me this? I never do this well, because that time that you had that look on your face of disgust, I, I felt like I was letting you down and I didn't want to hurt you. I didn't want to, and men lock that up. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. I think we need to learn how to communicate and say, you know what, I'm, I'm struggling to feel, to not feel shame around this the way you reacted to this. I, I, I know you love me, so watch how I do this. This is what I always try to do is, is reaffirm, create an open conversation. Say, I know you love me. So you don't create any doubt in the, in the conversation. The way that I saw you respond though, it brought up a lot of fear for me. And I know you didn't intend to do that, or I don't believe you do. Um, and so use that as an open, see, <laughs> it's like, that's a therapy type of skill. And uh -huh. we didn't marry therapists and, and yet we expect to have this great com communication and we, we get surprised that it was never brought up over the decades of being married. Well, because we shut each other down in these very subtle, but very powerful ways. Yeah. Now, when it's also uh, faith gets involved in things, well, first of all, I believe there's a big difference between church culture and church like teachings and principles. And sure. oftentimes culture has a stronger influence sometimes than the actual teaching behind it. But like we get a cultural message that 
you know, blank might not be good or blank is sinful or, or bad. And then, um, but your personal experience might differ from that mm -hmm. might be a very good experience. How do you integrate that? But now, now you have this clash, like on one hand, my, I, I thought my belief, my faith said this was sinful or wrong, but my actual experience is, is good. How, I'm sure you deal with that all the time. How, all the how time. do you integrate that? That's where I have people um, usually ask themselves three questions or, or two or three here is, is I have them pause and be a little bit more mindful about their experience and, and self-reflect. Where do these feelings come from? When we slow it down a little bit, we realize there's experiences behind some of these cultural statements that create fear, apprehension, um, and unnecessary restraints in our relationships. And so when I have them ask the questions, for example, what about this behavior or teaching um, do you believe is, is uh, not doctrinal, not of God, not of your faith? What history or experiences do you have that confirm that? or not confirm that. So what I have them do is draw on their own personal experiences. And often what I hear, almost, almost always, when we break it down past the, well, the church says this, and the church doesn't say this, what we find is people's actual life experiences behind those comments. Like, yeah, I heard my pastor or my church leader say this, and this is, you know, let's take oral sex is is of the devil or, or not of God. Uh, you may personally have had a set of beliefs or experiences before that or shortly after that comment that tell you this is bad. Maybe, maybe because you associate it with porn or maybe because you associate it with an unhealthy previous relationship. And so this is where we usually find the disconnect because in their current relationship, they may find joy in it and they can't reconcile it. And so that's where I think it's critical, like I was mentioning earlier, is to take this back to your relationship and trust your relationship with your partner and with your God that you'll get clarity around this. Let's not bring other church leaders and culture into the bedroom. I mean, we have a difficult enough time building our own relationship with one partner. We don't need to bring strangers or friends or family into the proverbial bedroom uh, to confuse those topics. Now, if you've taken to your partner and to your God and you still feel uncomfortable about it, then explore that from a values point with your partner, not a rule base like this God doesn't approve of it. That doesn't build faith. That doesn't build love in a relationship to just say God doesn't approve of it say why. Like I was telling earlier, if you love your spouse, don't just say you love them. Make some emotional and spiritual and sexual connections with it and saying why you find this in your relationship is not helpful and, and come from that, that framework. You do that, the net result is usually a stronger relationship mm -hmm. with God, a stronger mm -hmm. relationship with your spouse, because you've done the hard work yourself to reconcile and figure everything out in your own mind. Yes. And, and for example, for those who do decide after going through this type of process that certain behaviors aren't um, ideal for their relationship, if I could say it that way, uh, usually the partner who was wanting a certain behavior at the beginning, because of that connecting process, the resentment or potential resentment or pestering of that behavior doesn't occur anymore because equality has been achieved in the relationship, understanding and connection has been created. And so they can respect that. They're, they understand it's been discussed and it's been explored. Uh, and they're coming up with a solution together as opposed to one just being the authoritarian and saying, no. Got it. Any specific stories you can share of couples you've helped? Maybe general stories, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, so, so I'll-, I'll, I'll that I, all this, Everything we've talked about today, yeah, let me, I'm going to use my own family because we're very open about this. Uh, even though I'm a very private person, uh, you know, one of the things I actually value about transitioning into this career a little later in life 
is to be able to see that process in real time with my family from going from one approach at, and raising our kids to a new one when some of them were already in their late teens. And so we got to see this experience where a lot of what we're talking about today was brought up by the kids in, I think one or two, one was about to be married when I started uh, uh, counseling. And, and so we got to have real time experiences with couples, uh, with our family, children who were having some of these reactions, like, I don't know if I want to do this or whatever. And one, I was impressed that they could come to me and talk uh, as a family, we would have dinner conversations. Um, which are totally normal in our family. And some people might be thinking, wow, that's really weird. It's weird because you've never learned how to do it, but it's really great. And this is part of the, the success story is sometimes our kids would come. So all three of our girls are married. Now we have five kids, two younger boys and three older uh, girls, and they're all married. And so we got to see this with each of them play out where I would have them go through what I call a marriage survey before they get married, where it goes through all these questions and explores very specifically everything from behaviors to um, past experiences to what sex looks like to children bearing and so forth. And so they had to discuss what does it look like to have sex before we're married or excuse me, before we're married, what does it look like to have sex after we're married and what is and isn't allowed? And so we, we had them address it. So some of the kids would say things like, Ooh, that's gross. I don't even want to consider it. And we didn't have to say, okay, instead of saying gross, let's replace that language. Let's be a little bit more curious. The thing that they were concerned with, and this is part of that story is, is they felt like when they would explore that they were giving express, expressed, express permission to engage in that behavior. And that's not the case. First explore. And as the kids would explore, their minds would open up and they wouldn't feel so, it was interesting because the grossness would go away and the curiosity would increase. And I had one daughter tell me one time, she says, uh, after going through this experience and bonding with her husband and, and discussing and exploring new sexual behavior that she was sitting in church one day and she set, sent me a text and she was essentially burying her testimony to me. She was saying, because of going through these, uh, this approach to communication and approaching our sexual relationship this way, I not only feel closer to my husband, but I feel closer to God. And there is no way I would have ever thought that it, even especially now that I feel totally right about engaging in this certain behavior. And I want to be, I'm not avoiding specifics, but I know everybody has different specifics. So I, I'm keeping it general. I have fill no in issues. the blanks. Uh -huh. Yeah, fill in the blanks because everybody's experience is different, but yet it applies to everyone. And she felt that connection. Whereas in the past, she immediately shut it down. She was shutting herself down from her partner and from God, ironically, because she wasn't allowing it to be explored. Uh, and so in that experience, she felt like she had some very clear direction from, from the spirit, from the Lord, from her partner. And they have been bonding ever since they said, I, I could tell you to this day from, from my experience, their sex life would never have been as great as it was or is if they had not learned how to do this beforehand. Um, and that doesn't mean it's too late for people who haven't learned it but it can be learned. And when you approach it this way, success will come. I, I've yet to see an experience where people open up like this and use a language of curiosity and partnership um, where it's gone bad. It, it just, it, I've yet to see that. Um, but practicing where, where it is hard is learning how to do it consistently. And that takes effort. I never measure success based off a person's willingness to try, but each of my girls have gone through that experience where at one point they were like, no way, I can't consider this. I, you know, anything but vanilla sex is the right thing or anything other than what I want is usually how it is, right? When we, yes. when we hold the individual kind of accountable, their perception is anything other than what they want is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. so we have to help them remember like, that. And when we, when that look for the lowest common denominator and that's what your sex life ends up. Oh, being. <laughs> yeah. And that's so, so limiting. Um, but that's a general, you know, I have three cases that I feel comfortable in sharing. Uh, but I see that in, in each of my clients, very, very similar experiences. And as that happens, I, I can't tell you how many times I get emails from um, 
often the wife. It, and I think, again, not to buy into stereotypes, um, is a lot more resistant to exploring. I can't tell you often I get an email like six months or a year or two years later saying, I have to tell you, our sex life is better than it's ever been. And if, if I did not develop the language of curiosity, uh, we would not be here today. In fact, we would probably be divorced. And so it is so crucial to learn how to have um, love through curiosity. I love that. And through that companionship too. Companionship and curiosity, yeah. That's great. Uh, another question I have is, is it one's own responsibility to develop their own sexuality or is it the marriage's responsibility wow. to develop your sexuality? Oh like, my goodness. So is it, is it up to me to develop my own sexuality or is it up to my marriage to develop Ooh, my sexuality? This is a big question and I'm going to be uh, concise because I, I could spend many episodes on this one, uh, especially for faith couples um, where if, if you you've hold to a traditional Christian belief, where you try to hold yourself until marriage, uh, remaining chaste until marriage. Um, this implicitly communicates that sex is to be a partner act only. Um, while, while I think it is a partner act, there is definitely an experience that we are missing, and that is our development of our sexual understanding prior to marriage. Um, because we have this tradition and this culture of waiting till marriage, we also think that we can't learn anything about our own sexual health and development along the way. But that's like one of the biggest biological changes we experience as human beings in our teenage years is our sexual development. And I think it's absolutely critical. So to answer your question, I think it's both. But I'm going to emphasize the individual more because I think we as Christians tend to neglect that um, unintentionally, but we neglect it to a point that we don't know how to function in this curious language in a couple because we've never learned what we are comfortable with. We don't know, um, we haven't developed that relationship with ourselves and the Lord beforehand. And so learning, you know, we teach our kids who are growing up as teenagers how to take those questions to the Lord. Same thing. Use language. If, if you're a person of prayer, use a language of curiosity as opposed to yes and no. Is this appropriate, Lord? Yes or no? <laughs> should I explore this? Should I masturbate? Should I, should I have these feelings? Remove the shoulds and replace it with, God, I am experiencing this feeling. Wow, the body is magnificent. Help me understand how this plays into my role as a Christian, uh, as an individual, single Christian, help me understand how this plays into the gospel. Using language that is exploratory prepares you not only for marriage to have a, a curiosity language, but it opens your heart to the Lord in this area that is often taboo and uh, not just taboo, just not discussed at all. Um, and, and told, not just discussed at all either, but told to not even think about. Um, and that is such a missed opportunity because if, if God intended us to have these sexual feelings and these desires, I assure you, he's also intended us to be able to talk with him about it and to understand it along the way. So I think it, it is definitely a responsibility for us individually to develop our sexual identity and understanding before marriage so that we can then do it in marriage. I love what you said too about um, taking it to God. Like uh, oftentimes it feels like we get our hardware before we get our software, like our body <laughs> yes. develops first. Before oh, we get I love that analogy. Right? As yep. a software, it makes sense to me. Like, mm -hmm. um, so, but when you're curious and open, then you're gonna have the right programming or, you know, you can write your scripts better, or however you want to say that better. And even within, after you're married, you'll be constantly given opportunities to reevaluate your program or your scripts or however you want to call that. Like, and um, when you can t confidently, like, take it to God or, and to your spouse, that's going to be a lot more strengthening mm -hmm. than trying to look like 
And yeah, some answers might be found in scripture or might be found in like words of other church leaders, but you'll be led to those through your process of searching, but, but it starts from inside. You're looking for the answer from the inside first, not from the outside. Correct. It's, it's the direction it's going, I think, matters. Yeah, I absolutely believe that. It's, again, if, if you're not learning how to experience and discuss these things before marriage, it always, and again, this is not intended to be shameful or, or, or uh, criticizing, but it, it does surprise me that we think it's going to naturally happen in the relationship. I mean, think about any other aspect of your life. If you've never learned how to communicate <laughs> verbally, which I guess is, is a, a case for some people, uh, in a healthy way, how do you expect to build that in your in your relationship? If if you haven't developed it, how do you think it's going to occur in the relationship? You're going to bring the same patterns, culture, and traditions into the relationship that you had beforehand. And if your sexual understanding is void, how are how are you going to explore this with somebody else? I I think it can be done, but still in that process, you have to learn your own values, your own uh, a level of comfort and, and why you have those levels of comfort or discomfort. Makes sense. As we close this up, let's pretend you're talking to someone that's kind of gone through this. They've worked through those issues. Now they're in a great place. Sex is amazing and good, but it's kind of plateaued for a little while. What would you say are your black belt sex tips? To oh my goodness. D- nothing. Nothing new or revolutionary. I think even even for myself, I say that as though I am this exception, but it's important for myself to even remember. There, I like that phrasing better. It's important for me to remember to um, take time to tag up with my wife, not during sex, not before. I think afterwards is okay. That's usually a good time after orgasm to reflect, but I think it's important to have a tag up that's not associated with a sexual experience and check in. How is this going? Our bodies change, menopause, children, depression, anxiety, new job, whatever it is. Our fantasies, desires um, are constantly changing and evolving. And especially as we're getting more healthy in our relationships, it's like a, a onion. We're peeling back the layers and we're like, oh my goodness, Oh, I was never allowed to explore this before. I'm curious about this. And so checking in, because to assume that sex is to stay the same is a, is a recipe for failure. And to check in, are we still good with this? Are we curious about anything else? But if we learn that curiosity language, it, I, it will come more naturally as you're going out for a walk. You may naturally just, hey, you know what? We had great sex last night. How, how is this for you? I, I really liked it. And are you curious about exploring anything else? I really emphasize separate from sex because we want it to be integrated in a healthy way throughout our life, not just bedroom talk. We want to learn how to have that conversation throughout our life so that we always invite our partner to feel like they could express new thoughts or fantasies. And so again, nothing revolutionary, but a routine check-in. And if you remain curious, you'll learn how to have that language. So gosh, sometimes my wife and I will be out at a restaurant and we don't even have to say much because we're so comfortable with this. There'll be keywords. I'll say like, you know, how is this or that? And we already understand what each other's talking about because we have that history. And so it doesn't always have to be a private bedroom conversation. I, ideally, I want people to be more comfortable talking about it. Uh, clearly not like, hey, very detailed graphic in public. But my no. point is, is if you're driving in the car or you're on a walk or you're with your, your spouse somewhere, take it outside of the bedroom. If you want strong bedroom communication, sex and verbal communication, develop it outside of the bedroom. Love it. That's great. If people want to reach out to you and find out more about you, what's the best way to find you? Uh, My website is, uh, I have two, but um, danielaburgess.com. My name.com, danielaburgess.com is my uh, website that I host for the Improving Intimacy Group and podcast. And then my professional page is ascentfamilytherapy.com. Either way is fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
We hope that you enjoyed this episode of Get Your Marriage On. And if you did, we would love it if you would take a few seconds to give us a rating on iTunes and to share the show with your friends. They'll thank you for life. Once you've done that, you can head over to GetYourMarriageOn.com for more resources about today's topic and to download our amazing marriage apps. Now go get your marriage on.